New Orleans is the newest major city of all of North America. And the reason I say that, 5,000 years ago, that's not very long. Remember, the pyramids were about to come 5,000 years ago is the Gulf of Mexico. There was no land here. Uh, down at the mouth of the river, which is only 600 years old. You think about that. It was probably have buildings over in Europe that are old and then the newest land in Louisiana is called South Pass. It's a unique river system on the North American continent. There's no other river system that has built the amount of land and ecosystem as the Mississippi River. South Louisiana, it's been said, is not so much a place as it is a process. Uh, there have been some massive, massive changes in climate and weather through history. You've had ice ages when continuous winter happened all the way down into where the United States is now. Thousands of years ago, the glaciers started to melt. And when they did, the water had to go somewhere and it formed a river, which we call the Mississippi River. The topsoil of all of these states and parts of Canada emptied into the bowels of the Mississippi River. The river starts to fill in its valley, and then it gets to the coast. Then it starts building land out into the Gulf of Mexico. So the river is building land, building land, building land. The Mississippi River builds a delta that sticks out into the Gulf of Mexico on the south side of the United States. Even though this place looks timeless, it is the youngest land in the United States. Some of the youngest land in the world. None of the land we live on is more than a few thousand years old. Deltas began to form in coastal Louisiana. The bottom topography of the sea was right, the amount of sediment coming down, a lot of things fell into place so that a delta could begin to form. It's a large chunk of the continent. Uh, you know, any river that's going to deposit silt is going to be constantly building up new land, but it's also going to be eating it away. It's land that is in constant change. The Mississippi River has shifted a number of times during geologic time. And river systems like the Mississippi, they'll come down one channel, and then every year they flood, they make the natural levee. And then after a while, they shift because they're trying to find the fastest route to the sea. As you spring floods come in and the water spreads out, the velocity of the water slows down. It cannot support the silt that it has in it and it drops it out over the land and rebuilds the land. The heavy things like sand fall out on the bank and then the next heaviest fall out next and finally it carries some of the silts and clays eight or 10 or 20 miles away. This whole portion that forms the Mississippi Delta, which really isn't just the mouths of the river, but just a wide area on which New Orleans is built and extends uh, you know, about midway between New Orleans and Lafayette. Maybe 1,500 years ago, the Mississippi River traveled through what is now the city of New Orleans. When it moved to where it is today, it left the Metairie Ridge and the Gentilly Ridge. The Gentilly Road, some of it's natural, some of it's actually dredged and built up. Before the causeway, that was the route that you would take to go from the North Shore to the city. Monkey Hill used to be, which I think was some WPA thing out of the 30s, I'm not sure, they were digging out lagoons in Audubon Park and they piled up some mud and that became so-called Monkey Hill, the highest uh, elevation in, in the city, which I think was like, I don't know, 31 feet or something. A great deal of our area is below sea level. 60 to 70 percent of the city is uh, below sea level. The areas along the river uh, are pretty much above sea level. In South Louisiana, the high ground is next to the river. Unlike any place else in the country where you go down to the river, in Louisiana we have to first go up and then down the river. The most stable parts of the city tend to be the older parts of the city, because that's where the high ground was. In New Orleans, the natural levees probably were 10 feet high, right next to the river, and then they progressively slope away. From the high ground, which is basically the French Quarter, uh, in just a matter of tens of blocks, the land tapered off 
such that it, there was a marsh between the French Quarter and the lake. The lowest spot in all the city of New Orleans is in the eastern section of the city. It's uh, eight feet below sea level. It's on Bullard and Lake Forest Boulevard. If the Mississippi River, you know, overflowed its banks, we could have almost 30 feet of water in the city of New Orleans. Why would anybody want to build a city where New Orleans is we're below sea level. When they came here, they found alligators, snakes, and mosquitoes. No, it wasn't put here for the weather. It's just a, a very good intersection between various points. People were drawn to deltas because of the abundant resources and because it was easy to get around deltaic regions. Transportation was fairly easy. In the old days, the Indians used to come down the Mississippi River and cross bayous, or either they would portage their canoe over the dry land between Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. You could take a canoe down Bayou St. John and then you could take this portage and get into the Mississippi River system. It's less than a mile to actually have to, you know, carry the canoes. The Indians recognized that this was the shortest route. What they would do is come over across the lake and go out into the bayous and get what they call Rangia canata. It was shellfish. They would collect that. Uh, there's cases of eating oysters, going out and hunting raccoons, possums, various things like that. Lots of different types of fish. They talk about Louisiana being the sportsman's paradise. Well, it was the sportsman's paradise for the Indians as well. The Native Americans were smart about it. They didn't live in New Orleans in the summertime. Uh, they, they were here fall and winter, and in spring they went back upriver. When the French were here, they were talking with the Native Americans and they wanted to settle where there was a natural trade route. Bienville had a number of uh, Native American guides. He also had a number of Native Americans who, who wanted to kill him, but um, he had a number of guides who, who showed him the, the portage through Bayou St. John. Bayou St. John goes into Lake Pontchartrain. Lake Pontchartrain goes into the Gulf of Mexico. The major transportation route at that particular time was going along the Gulf Coast through the back lakes into Lake Pontchartrain. It's much easier for a sailing ship to come through the Lake Pontchartrain system, sailing and you know tacking back and forth across the lake, than trying to come up the Mississippi River. Two thirds of North America emptied into the Mississippi River. So when it comes down, we have what we call New Orleans the economic valve. It was put here because of the fact that it was a great transportation and commerce site. There was a lot of access and ability to transport goods and people. A lot of the peoples in New Orleans, at least originally, were related to either shipping or fishing. There was method in the madness. I don't know if they ever expected it to remain here uh, all that long, but there was certainly a uh, method behind placing New Orleans at this particular location. When New Orleans was settled in 1718, there were no levees, no levees at all. Of course, the city was much smaller and much more primitive and everything, but it was also more susceptible to any weather problems. They had river flooding and they had water that could come from the lake south of them or anywhere. In the early days, the river was a real serious problem. Like say, the very first year that New Orleans was here, we flooded 100%. And for the next three or four years, we flooded until they said, we got to do something. So they decided they would start building levees. They got it up to about eight or nine feet high, and one flood washed it out completely. So then they said, no, we got to really do something to, to keep it out of the city of New Orleans. And that's when they really put a full effort into it. And the first levees of any substance in North America were built right here in New Orleans. It's a, a pretty simple technology. Uh, it just consists of bringing the city with higher and higher levees as the water increases. And in order to protect the other parts of the state, the French decided that they would give land to people. And it was so many arpent, which is a French foot. It was also your job to maintain the levee. They would grant a landowner so many orphans along the river and so many orphans back. Normally what you would see is what they call the 40 orphan line. 
and usually when you got towards the 40 orbit, you started getting into some swampy area. The city is uh, saucer-like in shape and it's surrounded by flood walls. If you look at a geologic, a topo map of the city, New Orleans is a bulb. We levied all the way around to try to keep that, that water out. If it ever gets over the levees, it's going to be hard to get out because the levees then are working against you, you see. If during a high water event, if those should ever fail, then the city would be inundated. The greatest disaster in the history of the United States was the 1927 flood. Uh, there were literally 20 million people in North America and the United States were displaced by the water. The Mississippi River in the state of Louisiana was 30 miles wide. The federal government finally said, we can't have this happen again. It's hurting the economy as well as the people. So they decided to give one group control of it, the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Congress mandated the Corps of Engineers to come in here and build a levee system that would allow the development of coastal Louisiana in a way that had never been seen before. The decision was made, we're never going to let this river flood people this way again. This country made a decision you know, to build a levee system that would be impregnable, at least that was the belief. And it's largely worked. We have not flooded from the Mississippi River since then. A very dynamic river created all these wetlands as it switched its delta around the southern part of Louisiana. And now we've tried to fix it in one place, basically, in order to live here. We moved to this spot on the Mississippi, and then we decided we needed to maintain navigation in a very dynamic river, so we've maintained channels. River brought down flooding. We built up levees. The levees cut off flow to the marshes. If we did not control the Mississippi River, the Corps of Engineers did not control it, it would move back where it once went, and that was the Chafalaya Basin. The natural course of the river is to shift back that way and build that area, which is what it's done over hundreds and hundreds of years. The old river structure is preventing that and only letting about 30% of the water go down the Atchafalaya and the rest go down the Mississippi River. It's the epitome of battle of man over nature. The original drainage attempts came about as a need to move water not vast amounts of water because those days New Orleans was a French Quarter and the swamps. From the very beginning, uh, street gutters were constructed in New Orleans and uh, uh, early maps show uh, each square of the French Quarter surrounded by a little gutter and then little wooden bridges. By the 1800s, as the city started to expand, not only were the occupants of the city digging drainage ditches, but they realized they need more water routes. The canals were put in to collect the 60-odd inches of rain that the city gets all the time. Canals certainly play a major role fairly early on just because of the drainage problems. Through the 19th century, the city's drainage system remained primarily canals and street gutters. These were often in choked with mud and garbage and whatever else would pile up in the streets. Before the Civil War, a series of pumps were constructed along the Metairie Ridge. These were really very, very rudimentary. They used a paddle wheel device, pretty much the same as you find on the paddle wheel boat. It was about 30 feet in diameter and about 18 foot wide. So it would lift the water and move it out into the swampy area. The bad part of that is that when you had more rain, it overflows and brings it back in, which was a terrible situation. New Orleans was filled with stagnant water. It was very hard to get it out. And by the 1870s and 1880s, the city had really reached the point where it could not expand very much beyond its urban limits. As the city grew and more people moved in, uh, we had to drain more and more of the area. We have our problems with the natural enemies like mosquitoes, and if you couldn't dry out the land, if that swamp would have prevailed, then no telling what kind of diseases you'd have. Soon after the 1878 yellow fever epidemic, there was a growing knowledge about sanitation in cities, and it was felt that New Orleans, because of its very, very poor drainage system, was uh, one of the sickest cities in the United States, and it was. It had a very high death rate. In the past, just in the sheer matter of health, this has always been like a very unhealthy place. 
at the end of the 1890s. If the life expectancy in Boston was 54 years, well here it might have been like 38 years. Those are the areas that were all swampy, and they figured the best thing you can do from a public health standpoint is to drain them. It wasn't until they were able to develop efficient pumping systems that they could actually expand the city out. Basically, the drainage in New Orleans is totally artificial now. As time passed, the need developed for more sophisticated pumping systems. The father of the New Orleans drainage system is Albert Baldwin Wood. He was a graduate of Tulane University, a mechanical and electrical engineer, and a very brilliant man. And he is responsible for designing our drainage system and our drainage pumps. In 1897, he designed and built the biggest drainage pumps anywhere in the world, 14 feet in diameter. They were revolutionary. There was nothing like them on Earth. Even today, they're quite formidable in their ability to drain the city. Except for minor modifications, they're still the same original pumps that are pumping today that pumped in the early 1900s. Mr. Albert Baldwin Wood also designed them because he knew that the city of New Orleans, being below sea level, if it doesn't rain for a month, we still have to drain the water because we got the seepage from the river, we got the lake, we got the marshes. The metropolitan area is, uh, is virtually surrounded by levees. It creates a requirement that every drop of rain that falls within that levee system has to be pumped out. Water is pumped out of the city by the millions of gallons a day, even when it's not raining, just to keep the city dry. By necessity, all of the drainage stations were placed at the lowest points in the city because the only way to get the water to the stations is by gravity. When it rains, the water flows onto the street, from the street into the catch basins, large pipelines, then bring it to covered canals or open canals. We have many open canals in the city. And from the canal, it comes to the suction basin or the wet well of the pumping station. There, the pumps, aided by a, a vacuum system, suck the water into the pump. And by means of an internal propeller, water is propelled from the pump discharged into either another canal, which then goes to another drainage station, or ultimately to the lake. The 17th Street Canal, which separates the city of New Orleans from Jefferson Parish, uh, for many, many years was the highest capacity pumping station anywhere in the world. It pumps, I think, upwards of 10,000 cubic feet per second capacity into that canal. Uh, the canal is levied on both sides down to the pump station so that you can pump into the canal and, uh, and during a storm event it keeps the water out. There are approximately 19 major drainage pump stations. Uh, some of them are located on the lakefront, Lake Pontchartrain. Many of them are located in the inner city. There's been an ongoing drainage pumping construction program to keep pace with the needs of the city. The pumping stations are still currently being improved upon. Pump drainage is a way of life for us. The city of New Orleans, many, many years ago before it was formed, was a rural area or swampy area, and it had an entirely different microclimate. But as we build and put highways down, pavement down, subdivisions, buildings, all of this sort of thing, we create what's called a heat island. I know about Arizona and the temperatures in Arizona and, and lower California and all. There is no heat. They ain't seen nothing until I get here. There's no heat like this heat. And it's almost a cliche, but yeah, it is the humidity, stupid. We have the best weather in the world. We have a very short winter season. Last year it was on a Wednesday in the afternoon. People get excited about whether there's earth warming and they tend to judge changes in weather by what's happening at the moment or happened last year. But in truth, you're talking about swings in climate temperature, tremendous swings. Anytime you have a glacial period, the sea level is going to drop. But right now they're melting, so the sea level's coming up. A very subtle change in temperature or in sea level can cause astronomical consequences. The big concern is maybe the use of fossilized fuels 
is making this happen faster than it normally does. Global warming is, is very dangerous for Louisiana. If you get increases in water level, six inches, 12 inches, it completely alters the ecosystem that the plants are in. You're gonna have much more salt water in and it'll start killing off the brackish and the freshwater marsh. So it's gonna be devastating to the, the whole coast of Louisiana. There's no high land between us and the Gulf. You could wind up with New Orleans being almost an island if it was there at all. The amount of sea level rise that is projected associated with global warming is relatively small compared to a fairly large amount of subsidence that we already have. Much of the city has shrunk in elevation because of the dewatering of the city. The water table gets lower, the ground shrinks, and so the topography is such that it follows with the dewatering process. The main reason the city is sinking is because of the levees. I mean, it's, it's a real double-edged sword. We don't flood when the river rises anymore. But on the flip side, when the river did overflow the banks, it deposited silt. So it was this sort of natural process of the ground sinking, as it sort of naturally does, but then more land was deposited on top of it. And of course, we don't have that redeposition of soil anymore. The types of soil that were brought down by Mississippi River compact over time. And, you know, when you have a river flooding every year, you get a fresh layer of sediment on top, so you, you don't sink as much. But, you know, we've been cut off from the, the Mississippi River for uh, flooding-wise 150 years, so, you know, the, the soils just keep compacting and compacting and going down. And that's the same thing that's happening in coastal wetland marshes where they don't have the, the sediment coming back in. They're compacting down, so they get to be a point where the type of vegetation cannot live because the soil is too far down, so it becomes open water. What happens when you drain one of these areas and you take out the water and a soil that is normally wet becomes dry, not only do you take out the water and lose some volume, that organic matter starts to decompose. As the city has grown out to Lake Pontchartrain and out into the surrounding swamps, into the surrounding levees, that water isn't being absorbed by the soil. It's flowing out, it's being pumped out of the city uh, by the drainage system. It, it's flooding into canals and then somehow or other being moved out of the city or piling up in the city, but it's not sinking back into the, the ground to keep that spongy soil high. Many of the houses, particularly in, in New Orleans, are not uh, pile founded, they're just set on piers. And each pier settles as the ground settles and then you get that differential settlement where one settles more than the other and that starts racking the house and causing problems. We're number two in the nation with potholes. Because you have a flood, you don't get a uniform sediment load across everything. You have different pockets, different sands, different types of sediments drop out of different places. So you have this, you know, different bands. And as they compact, they compact at different rates. The area that we've been building subdivisions in for the last, you know, 40 years, uh, there, was, there was a reason nobody lived there before. Soils weren't suitable. Some of those neighborhoods, if you drive them today, you will see the houses tilting, the streets buckling, pipes breaking. I think the major threat to us is the threat by hurricanes. The worst hit we've ever had was, uh, was Hurricane Betsy. My wife was here for Betsy. She thought she was going to die. I mean, it was a terrifying experience. When we had, of course, the report from Nash Roberts that, you know, was coming our way, I told my kids and my wife, I said, uh, you must get the things that you would like to have and keep because I want to put them in the attic. Certainly, we would glue ourselves to television and watch Nash Roberts. Get his crayon out with his chalkboard and go through the analysis of uh, where it's going to hit. Betsy was an interesting storm in that the way it was set up, there was a high pressure system right over the southeast part of the U.S. And there was another high pressure system over Bermuda. And between these two high pressure systems was a trough, sort of a ditch between the two hills of pressure. And it looked very much like the storm was going to follow that weakness, that trough, that crack in between the two highs and go on up the East Coast. We had uh, 
just finished the construction of our easternmost station, which is on the levee and it discharges into the intercoastal waterway. However, we didn't have any fuel. We had fuel tanks in place, but they were below ground. It made very little progress. It started slowing down, and I couldn't figure out why it was slowing down at first. And all of a sudden, it stopped, and it made a loop. Then I realized what was going on. The two highs had started a bridge across to block the trough. It was a solid high-pressure system from out and over the Atlantic to over Louisiana, but couldn't go up north. The only thing he could do is come west. So I knew it was going to cross Florida and come into the, the Gulf. I remember the day the storm hit, it was actually predicted to go into Galveston. The map on the front page of the newspaper showed this little dotted line, this is where it was going to go. And by, you know, noontime, the wind was already beginning to pick up and really start howling. The way the upper high pressure system was and the winds aloft were, they just came west until they got almost to the mouth of the Mississippi River and then it ended. When that hurricane hit, it reached a levee just east of the station and water from the canal flowed into New Orleans. It was hard. It blew the roof off my house. We were without electricity, water, or anything for days. It was my task to get the station running. When I got to the railroad tracks, all I could see was water. There was an aluminum skiff and an outboard motor. You know, in good spirits, I said, well, I'm going to accommodate this in the name of the water boy. Jumped in the boat, cranked it up, and went point to point. Got to the station, and the water was within a couple of feet of the station floor. The engines were idle. Nobody there but me. I had a radio with me. So I called back, and I told them, I said, look, there's nothing to do here. And they said, well, just stay there anyhow. We'll get you some fuel. So within a couple of hours, up the intercoastal waterway comes an army duck with the National Guards. And they had 55-gallon drums of diesel fuel. I cut some hoses, stuck it in the drums, and started operating the pumps. And I pumped water for three days straight. And the water never went down for about a half inch. They had known that the levee had been breached, but just keep pumping anyhow because it's a good faith effort. I do remember we did not have electricity in my neighborhood for seven days. Power had been knocked out. It was the people in the low-lying areas that really sustained damage. It hugely destroyed the coast. It was, by the way, the first billion dollar storm in North America. I know after Betsy, uh, just reading out of town, Newspapers, there were many cities reporting that New Orleans was no more. There was an obituary to New Orleans. I think it was on the front page of the Manchester Guardian. The Gulf Coast region is unique in the world in the number of really catastrophic tropical storms that hit the region. Every year we get the scenario that a hurricane or some particular storm event could come in. You're at the whim of Mother Nature. At least on the hurricanes, we know they're out there. We have a pretty good idea whether they're coming our way or not. Scientists are constantly trying to get a handle on any information that will help them predict these storms. And the best way to find out is to go back and look at what happened under certain synoptic situations. Everything I could find, most of it is based on logs of vessels that were in the port here at the time. Or the Jesuits priests kept records of things. And of course, the early newspapers, the periodicals, would always cover the storm because they were a big event. Today, I think there are just more people who are more familiar with the workings of the hurricane. We have a much greater idea of where they're going to go. Should the hurricane approach at the right angle, the water in the lake could actually be pushed back through the pumps into the canals in the city in order to prevent this, most of the stations have uh, been retrofitted with gates. So you got a problem there. If the lake gets too high, you're going to have one agency, the Corps of Engineers, closing the gates. And then you'll have the water board with the need to pump to go to the lake with nowhere to pump to. So that has to be coordinated very closely. Most of the hurricanes come from June through October, November. Well, those are the times when the river's at its slowest. You don't have the big flooding caused by the river. If you had a coincidence where a storm 
came up towards the mouth of the river, when the river was at flood, you could top the levees. Hurricane George was only a class two hurricane, but it just happened to hit under the right wind conditions and the right tide conditions, such that it had uh, pretty dramatic effects. These camps had been here for decades. They had weathered the major hurricane of 1947, Hurricane Betsy, 1965, Hurricane Camille, 1969. Much larger hurricanes than Hurricane George in 1998. These camps were destroyed. We should be very cautious about thinking that the last hurricane is anything like the next one. We are not the same city we were when Hurricane Betsy came ashore. There's just so much you can do to protect an engineered place, and that's why I think New Orleanians are so afraid of hurricanes, because a direct hit would take the city out. I mean, the estimates are that a direct hit on New Orleans would put us underwater at some level or other for six months at least. The hurricane threat to New Orleans comes from Lake Ponce Train overtopping the levee, would put 10, 20 feet of water, possibly 30 feet of water in the city. Once the water comes over the levee, and if the wind continues long enough, New Orleans will fill up to the top of the levee. New Orleans is probably more vulnerable than any other urban center, certainly in the United States, and probably more vulnerable than any other city in the world. The city's at risk, and the new numbers are 100,000 dead. City government be inoperable for three to six months. The city has already negotiated with governments on the North Shore to relocate city government until the city's repaired. The Red Cross announced we're not opening any hurricane evacuation shelters in South Louisiana. Those are places you should not evacuate to. Those are places you should evacuate from. I remember that announcement. I mean, the reaction in a lot of the local communities around here was, how dare they? Red Cross basically said, we'll come down and help you afterwards, but we are not going to put our people at risk, and we're not going to encourage people to stop halfway in an evacuation. People are going to have to cooperate and, and do an early evacuation and just decide that that's one of the costs of living in New Orleans. Just take a little trip and go somewhere else. If you wait too late, it's too late. They ought to take it upon themselves to have evacuation plans. If a storm is headed toward New Orleans, that they have a plan on getting themselves and their family out of the city. Unbelievably, until about three years ago, there was no real coordinated evacuation plan. They didn't plan to change the traffic patterns. It's still going to be you know, two lanes on each interstate out. For the most part now, it's to turn almost all the roads going outside of town into one-way roads out. You know, if people start evacuating, any place you go, you're going to put yourself in some sort of danger because you don't know what sort of rising water you're going to have surrounding you. Interstate 10 going in either direction out of the city getting up to Interstate 59 and any of the other interstates leading out of the city, you're going to go over an awful lot of water to get there. And, you know, you're supposed to evacuate, what is it, 48, 72 hours ahead of a storm hitting. Most people have to work. They can't go in and tell their boss, I'm evacuating. They are now going to try to tell people, I think, five days in advance whether you should evacuate. The realization is three days, it's not enough time. Will people do it? Remains to be seen. But I do think that finally realizing that New Orleans had become increasingly vulnerable, and it's been more than a generation since New Orleans has been hit by a hurricane. A lot's changed in 25 to 30 years. And how much wetland has been lost since Hurricane Betsy hit? So how much has hurricane protection been reduced? And most people don't realize that the wetlands that have been lost were the buffer against hurricanes. And so if you cut that in half, then your protection against hurricanes is half what it was when there was a Hurricane Betsy. The wetlands provide an important facet to our coastal protection system. When the storm makes landfall, it loses its energy source. It needs water and it needs warm air to fuel it. The marsh itself would provide friction, which would slow down the wind, you know, absorb tidal surge, and again, without the warm water to fuel the storm, it starts to die. They figured that for every 2.7 miles of marsh that you had in front of you, you'd knock down storm surge by one foot. And New Orleans isn't right on the coast. You know, we're roughly you know, 60 miles from the mouth of the river here. When you had 60 miles of swamps and marshes, I mean, for a storm to reach you, it had to go over something. It has less and less to go over now.
it's very important that uh, we keep those wetlands there for many, many reasons, but hurricane protection is a very important one. With this whole change of the ecosystem down here, we're getting less uh, vegetation for the birds to live in, less marsh land for different types of species to nest and breed, so we're seeing a real impact there. Because of all of that nutrient here, over thousands and thousands of years, you've had this Mississippi River flyway develop where birds that are living down in Central America will come through this area into North America and then spread out to go up and nest and lay their eggs. And then at the end of the year, after they've hatched all their babies and fledged them, then they all fly back through this area heading south. The Mississippi Flyway provides wintering habitat for between 50 and 70 percent of the ducks and geese that live in North America. Some of them stay here all winter and some of them stop here a while and then go down the coast to Mexico or go across the Gulf. Petrochemical plants in Louisiana discharge more into the environment than other states in the U.S. If you have all these different petrochemicals in the Mississippi River, and you start diverting out into the marsh and wetlands, what kind of impact is it going to have on the ecosystem out there? And we don't know. The brown pelican, the state bird, all died because we used DDT as a pesticide. And as that came down the river, it would get into the fish, and then the pelicans ate the fish. And then when they laid eggs, the eggs would just have a thin shell. Then when the mother tried to sit on them to keep them warm, she'd break them. And so all the pelicans in Louisiana died from the pesticides that came down the river. Eventually, this country banned DDT, but it took a while for it to get out of the ecosystem. And then we brought in pelicans from Florida. It took a couple of tries, but now they're all over the state. It's wonderful to see them again. The coastal wetlands in Louisiana provide 40% of the nation's fisheries. The Louisiana wetlands are so productive that it's comparable to the production of the Atlantic seaboard. Marshes are a nursery for baby fish, shrimp, crabs, etc. And without the marshes, these animals wouldn't be here. Actually, 95% of all marine life on the whole Gulf of Mexico spends part of their lifetime in the Louisiana marshes. As the grass dies, it first breaks up into pieces of grass that some animals eat, and then eventually it decays into nutrients that causes other grass to grow. And then big crustaceans eat the smaller ones, bigger fish eat those, and eventually you have a whole food web in the marsh that is extremely rich, whereas the Gulf just has a lot of the top predators. Our heritage revolves around those wetlands and the seafood and the crawfish and the fishing and the recreation activities that occur in those wetlands. If those wetlands go away, then in essence, who we are is changed. We're not the same people, we're not the same state, we're not the same environment. We definitely have less land now than we did just 10 years ago or five years ago. Millions of acres less than we had 100 years ago. Every year I hear something saying, well, we lost another 300 yards of shoreline. You know, I don't know how many years you can go before it starts to alter the shape on a map. The best way to measure your land loss or your land presence is with the satellite images. That has been very dramatic. We have satellite images of the mouth of the Mississippi River, for instance. And if you were to look at one 20 years ago and look at it today, 50% of the land is gone that was there 20 years ago. Between 1932 and 1990, over 690,000 acres of wetlands around New Orleans disappeared. That's over 1,000 square miles. 40% of the wetlands in the United States occur in Louisiana. 80% of the loss occurs here. As we built the levees around New Orleans, we stopped the flooding. The flooding had nourished this landscape. Flooding adds an inch it sinks an inch, so there's like a dynamic equilibrium. Man's footprint on the environment pretty much put the natural system out of balance. New Orleans has always been something of a temporary bargain. Every time we build levees higher, pump more areas, cut more swamps, we find that we've created a new situation to have to cope with. The price we pay for keeping this river in this channel is 
never gets back out into its floodplain. It does not replenish the swamps and marshes. And they subside, erode, they disappear. People did not really foresee the extent of the wetlands loss, I believe maybe 40, 50 years ago. And now it's become real apparent what that will ultimately mean, just allowing 25 square miles of marsh to just disappear and turn into open gulf waters. The rate at which we're losing our wetlands is absolutely horrendous. It's certainly not a new process. Part of it is sort of just a natural geologic process. The, the shoreline, especially in marshy areas, subsides and erodes. I think we've accelerated that process in any number of ways. Recreational vehicles accelerate that process. Nutria, for instance, in some areas, these are these rats that are of the, you know, really quite large rats that actually go out and eat the marsh. The McElhenney's introduced, I don't know, six nutria from Argentina because they thought they would eat the water hyacinth. Water hyacinth was becoming a big problem, blocking up waterways and things like that. And by the time they got to New Orleans, there were 30 odd of them because they breed so rapidly. And then in some hurricane or something, they escaped and now they're all over the place. They're much more destructive than muskrats because muskrat eat the grass, whereas the nutria dig for the roots. And so the muskrat's kind of like a lawnmower, it crops the top and the grass grows. Nutria just kills the grass. Our wildlife and fisheries have done studies that show they have significant impact. 17% of the oil and 25% of the gas this nation uses and produces goes through Louisiana waters. The construction of oil and gas canals allowed salt water to come in. And many of the marshes in Louisiana are brackish water marshes and cannot tolerate certain salt levels. Once the salt water comes up into these marshlands, it's a much faster killer than fresh water. In coastal Louisiana, we like to see a good balance of freshwater marsh, followed by intermediate marsh, brackish marsh, and salt marsh. And that's what you need to maintain the balance of the ecosystem so that all the critters out there and all the plants can interact in a healthy way. It's not so much that nutria or muskrats or oil field canals or levees on the Mississippi River, any one of those individually is really the problem. All have created a situation right now that has South Louisiana in a state of collapse and so goes South Louisiana, so goes New Orleans. We finally come to the realization you can't muscle this system around. Mark Twain wouldn't have been surprised to know that if you read Life on the Mississippi. He talks about the hubris of trying to muscle the Mississippi River. It's taken us a while to live the wisdom of Mark Twain. And the irony is that most of the things that we now recognize as the biggest contributors to the problem were at the time sold as the keys to prosperity. Louisiana is faced with these huge environmental challenges, these huge infrastructure, public safety challenges, and it's going to require partnerships between local government, state government, and federal government because no one has enough money to do everything that we want to do. And we have to prioritize and find the best path with the most practical solution to preserving New Orleans. One fellow had the idea, and he was partially successful, taking old automobile tires and laying the tires out. The theory being the water would wash sand over the tire and it would fill up the cavity, and repeated placement of tires would ultimately build up some landmass. Every year, there's a big drive around the city to collect Christmas trees. You know, we actually started the Christmas tree program, educated a lot of people that there is a marsh out there, and it's helped keep a lot of trees out of landfills for a while. But anybody who thinks you're going to save this place with Christmas trees or similar Band-Aid projects is kidding themselves. We really have to use the river. It's the biggest river in the United States. It's the biggest river in North America. It's the biggest resource we have. We have small problems and we can deal with small problems with small solutions, but if we're going to get our arms around the big problem, we have to use the biggest resource we have and that's the river. We want to create a sustainable ecosystem. We have developed several techniques for doing it. One of the most effective is the river diversion. We're going to make strategically placed, very controllable gaps in the levees and let the water out into the marshes, guide it out to where we need it, and let it really restore the health and vigor back to those marshes. The idea is, again, to put the river at least functionally back to some degree 
where it had been 100 years before. Some people are going to be hurt economically. Now, those people are going to fight the versions. So the way we're going to get over this is by simply going in and say, we're going to use state money to compensate you. Diversions, for the most part, are bringing fresh water into the wetlands, but they actually do very little to bring sediment in, and it's the sediment that's really needed to counterbalance the natural subsidence that takes place on the delta. What we need are inexpensive ways to dredge material from the river or from the offshore and bring that material into the wetlands to build up the elevation of the wetlands. The state is pressing the Corps to use the materials they dredge out of the Mississippi River and channels to in fact benefit the wetlands, go out and start placing it in areas where you can then have natural growth. We just started farming marsh recently. These bays that were solid water back in the 1930s and now they're shallow plant salt marsh on them. Those plants baffle the wave energy and whatever sediment is in the water falls out and the land comes back again. We're developing new plants that grow faster and stronger we went into areas of high stress and picked plants and grew them in greenhouse and basically cloned them. We have field tested them. It's been hugely successful. We need to restore the barrier islands. We're talking about dredging sand from offshore to raise the elevation of the islands and extend the width of the islands. It's gonna take a long, long time and a lot of work and a lot of money. We've neglected that area for so long, now people are beginning to realize what a precious program that is to restore that land. Louisiana just has to get smart about the way it starts taking care of its resources. Louisiana can't do it alone. We need the help of the federal government. But it's so hard to get Congress to take action on something like this, and Louisiana doesn't have a lot of political power. All we have is the appeal to the national sense to save the coast. If everybody in the state legislature received four or five letters, that's all they'd be talking about. They would get so focused on coastal issues, but they're not getting that mandate from the electorate. Educating the public and officials on how to deal with these situations is one very important aspect. We're beginning a national awareness program because this is a national treasure. This is the largest wetland by far. There's a lot of money in Washington. It just depends on what their priorities are. What we've got to do is not go try to create new money, we've got to go try to create new priorities. When you now hear you know, businesses, you know, bankers, insurance companies, saying that a naturally sustainable coast is the only way for us to survive, you know that a light bulb's gone on somewhere, and we just hope it's not too late. When we talk about conserving coastal Louisiana, it's not that we're gonna conserve coastal Louisiana the way it is today. We're gonna to conserve a way of life the ambiance, the music, the food, the manner of the people. All of these great things that, that people seem to love about coastal Louisiana are, are things that can be conserved. We are survivors. People of New Orleans will be here thousands of years from now.